Hi, Fanel here from FanelsPriory.com. Welcome to episode 5 of the Contented Countryman podcast. In this episode, I'll be talking about the joys of cycling along quiet country lanes. And in celebration of this, I'll be reading a chapter on the subject from my new book, Fine Things. So, make yourself comfortable as we enjoy a spot of rural cycling. Through spring and summer, there are a few things I enjoy more than a gentle bicycle ride in the countryside. I find that dawn is the best time to do it. It's when the air's cool and mist lingers in the fields and hollows. I leave my home, push forward on my bicycle, take a deep breath and hear the silent roar of wind passing my ears. The whole experience makes me feel vibrantly and passionately alive. Alone upon the road, I'm more likely to see foxes, badgers, deers and rabbits running and hopping along the quiet lanes than a human travelling along them. It's a peaceful time and a calming exercise that makes me realise that two wheels are better than four and that it's all too easy to travel too quickly and miss the view of what's around us. Better I find to slow things down, breathe deeply, smell the air, hear the dawn chorus Feel the morning mist upon your face and feel truly alive. That's the pleasure of rural cycling. So in celebration of this, and as we were approaching the summer months, I thought it'd be nice to read you a chapter from my new book, Fine Things. It talks about how I came to rediscover my love of cycling when, through a desire to lose weight, I decided to purchase a bicycle. And after having the shock of my life in seeing how modern bicycles are now made of carbon fibre and that they cost a fortune, I decided to look elsewhere to discover traditionally styled bicycles and, jaw-dropper that it was, the ultimate ride known as the Pashley Governor. It made me very, very happy. So here's the story, as read from Fine Things. The Governor. There comes a time between friends when certain guards can be lowered and no action, however extreme, can prove shocking. I've shared things with you, so we might as well get closer. With this in mind, I'd like you to calm your thoughts, put your hands on your thighs, and picture an up-close image of my buttocks. To be precise, I'd like you to imagine them moist with perspiration and wiggling purposefully from side to side. Do it slowly. Can you see them? They're there, almost within reach. Do you need a little more time to focus? Do I need to clench my cheeks? Or are you okay with the image that you've got? Would it help if I said, jig jig, jig jig? Come on, you're not trying hard enough. Look, surely they're the best and most pert things you've seen all day. Mm, 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 No? Pity. I hope they might have caught your attention. Now, What if you pictured the same warm, gyrating buttocks wrapped in black lycra that clings to all the curves, crevices and dimples, but sags and flaps in all the places that I wish it wouldn't? It's not a pretty sight, is it? (laughs) Now I've subjected you to the worst (laughs) possible image imaginable, and having probably caused you permanent psychological harm, I'm poised to make a firm promise to you that the images you just pictured will never, ever, ever come true. Apologies if this saddens you, but it ain't going to happen. There's no more chance of me wearing skin-tight lycra than there is of seeing a swan paddling a canoe. And yet, as a cyclist, I'm supposed to wear this sort of thing. But it's not me. I'm not of that ilk. I'll never shave in all my legs or apply for membership of the Squeaky Cheeks Cycling Club. So why am I getting so emotional about stretchy fabric and cycling? Firstly, lycra on a middle-aged man is wrong. Plain and simple. It might be okay on muscular athletes, but on the rest of us, it looks as flattering as seeing a man in shorts cutting his toenails in public. Can you imagine it? Aha, very pleased to meet you. 
although I appear to have already met the family Gherkins. Secondly, I developed a strange perception of cycling after visiting my local bicycle shop this morning. Let me explain. I've been worried for some time that my midriff is beginning to show the signs of me drinking too much ginger beer. All that sugary fat wobbling about on my waistline. It's not good. To make matters worse, my legs have become spindly from spending too many months sitting at my writing desk. Knowing that I'm a little too close to 40 for comfort, I decided to get fit. And as I'm completely averse to treadmills, in fact, I'm probably allergic to them, I opted, with Mrs H's blessing, to buy a bicycle. I'd managed to save £100. And I would spend all of it on the bicycle if I had to. With no desire for compromise, I promised myself and expected to get a really good bike. Sadly, the last time I got a bicycle was when rally choppers were the grooviest things on the street and a BMX could help you fly across the sky. In fact, the more I thought about it, I'd never actually purchased a bike. They'd always been a gift from Santa, so I didn't really know where to get one or how much they cost. Fortunately for me, a local newspaper advert revealed that there was a bicycle shop in town, so I'd pay them a visit. The Free Wheels Bicycle Shop was named apparently for reasons other than the price of its bicycles. As I stood outside gazing through the window, I could focus only on the price tags and the signage that said, Sale now on! Amazing bargains! Prices from as little as £800. £800 for a bike in the sale? <sighs> for that money, I'd want something that came with an engine. I reasoned that the bikes in the window were highly specialised and that there'd be something inside that would suit my budget. I was wrong. Once inside, I found that the bikes in the window really were in the sale. The first non-sale bike I saw was labelled £1,500. The second, a garish fluorescent yellow thing, was labelled £1,800. And a third was an astonishing £2,400. Bicycles had either become super desirable or some marketing man was having a laugh. An assistant approached me. Can I help you? He said. <laughs> Not at these prices, I replied. Is it usual for bikes to cost the same as a second-hand car? Oh yes. But don't be put off. They're the cheapest around. We don't stock rubbish, you know, though. They're, they're all good brands that will last at least a few years. A few years? Don't you mean a lifetime? Not these days, mate. Not with carbon. What, what do you mean? Micro fissures. Micro what? These bikes have carbon frames right and wheels and they're subjected to lots of juddering and jarring from the road. Over time the knocks can cause microscopic fractures in the carbon fibres which build and build and then BANG! The whole bike can explode. Explode? <laughs> yeah, actually the guy over there had it happen to him last weekend. The assistant called to his colleague behind the counter. Joe! What speed were you doing when your bike blew up? About 50 miles per hour, came the reply. Joe then lifted his t-shirt to reveal a graze that spanned the width and length of his back. Other than these cuts, said Joe, all I was left with were two tyres, a chain and the brake cables. The rest of the bike just disintegrated. That never happened with tubular steel bikes, I stated. Oh man, they went out years ago, replied the assistant. When did you last buy a bike? Er, uh, sometime in the early 1980s. Jeez, that was before I was born. You don't want something from back then. Those bikes were too heavy. <laughs> you want something special. OK, I replied. Impress me. The assistant pointed to a matte black road bike with tyres the thickness of spaghetti and a saddle sharp enough to skin a deer. It's a Shiv Di2 with cross optimised airfoils, OSBB, 
Control tower fit, fuselars, integrated hydration system, ceramic bearings, TT chains, nylon balls, 2 times 10 reversible 12.5mm body geometry, black belt protector and full carbon clinchers. Yours for five grand. Five thousand pounds? It looks like it could blow away at any minute. What do you expect? It's top of the range. Sorry, it's a little too uh, slick for me. And I have no idea what a carbon clincher or a black belt protector is. In fact, I have no idea what any of it is. I like things to be classically styled, handmade in Britain and made of steel. Is it any of these? No. Listen, I'm after something with mud guards, a pannier, a gear lever that can be operated by my thumb, possibly a wicker basket, and definitely a saddle that won't perform a Jewish operation on my manhood. Oh, you want a traditional bike? We don't stock those. Suppose you did, and I wanted the traditional equivalent of that helium-filled scythe over there. What would I be looking for? You'd want a Pashley. They're the best. Most stylish they are, and they have the best heritage. Pashley is the oldest bike manufacturer in Britain. Their bikes would be perfect for you. Go look them up. I thanked the assistant, winced at the guy behind the counter, and then left the shop with the sole intention of finding out more about this manufacturer of traditional styled bikes. Two hours later, I was standing in the traditional cycle shop in Stratford-upon-Avon, having a very different conversation. Would sir be cycling in the town or country? said the manager. Uh, Mostly country, with some urban cycling, I suppose. That's inevitable, I replied. And would sir favour an upright or a crouch cycling position? Um, Upright for when I'm taking it easy, or leaning forward when I really want to push for high speeds like five miles an hour. And what would Sir's budget be for such a bike? Reflecting on recent events and wishing to avoid further embarrassment, I replied, About £800. Then please come with me. We've just the thing. The man walked me to an area of the shop containing a line of the most beautifully styled bicycles. Some were Edwardian in fashion with black frames and tanned leather seats. Others looked continental with pastel coloured finishes, willow baskets and leather pannier bags. These were the sorts of bikes I sought. The sort one could ride while wearing a tweed suit and a very large grin. So it looks like the kind of gentleman who appreciates quality, who seeks something with refined style, said the manager. But you're a young chap. You don't want something that creaks and rattles like a vintage pram. You need something with street cred that looks the business. Am I right? Absolutely. Then have a look at this. The man pointed to a bike that made my mouth pucker like a chimpanzee requesting a large gobstopper. Pashley Governor, said the manager, named after the owner of the firm and styled on a 1930s path racer bicycle. It's got a Reynolds 531 tubular steel frame, North Road handlebars with leather grips, silver and stream wrap trap pedals, a Brooks antique brown leather saddle, Sturmy Archer three-speed gears, westward rims, relaxed forks and cream swab tyres. And it's made by hand here in Stratford. Which means, when you add them all together, and then I stopped him in his tracks and said, that it's pure sex! I've got to have it! Um, monthly payments, okay? The man smiled, knowing that the bike had sold itself. I didn't need to sit on it or ride it or haggle over the price. It was a dream bike. No carbon gizmos, no risk of explosions, just the best looking, most stylish bike I could have wished for. In fact, it epitomised one of my favourite literary quotes, that of H.G. Wells in The History of Mr. Polly, where he said, He did not ride at the even pace sensible people use, who have marked out a journey from one place to another. He rode at variable speeds, and sometimes he was so unreasonably happy that he had to whistle and sing. Which is how, after a day of mixed emotions, I have come to own one of the best fine things I've ever seen. A Pashley Governor bicycle. All I need to do now is ride it. So there we are, the chapter called The Governor, read from my new book, Fine Things. It's available to purchase now at fennelspriory.com.
I hope you liked it and that it's inspired you to get outdoors and appreciate the wonders of the countryside. Do it. We'll do it on two wheels. <laughs>